Well, good morning. Good morning. Welcome to worship on this third Sunday of Advent. Janice, thanks for setting the tone for worship with those beautiful carols of the season. As we prepare our hearts to worship this morning, it's good to be back with you. And it was a joy to get to be one of the remote crowd last week and to watch on Facebook live a couple hours later. Um, as I was in Utah with my military unit leading worship there for them. And it's always a joy to see what's happening back here. So it's good to be with you this morning. I want to begin with a song, a song of praise this morning as we enter into God's courts. Here is what the words of the psalmist say in Psalm 117 and 118. It says, praise God, everybody. Applaud God, all people. His love has taken over our lives. God's faithful ways are eternal. Hallelujah. Thank God because He's good. Because His love never quits. Tell the world. God's love never quits. And that's reason to give joy indeed this morning. You know, these words of the Psalms that Paula and I read each week as we enter into worship are the lyrics of songs which have been sung for generations. And we are blessed this morning to begin our time of worship in song as Amy comes to lead us in a beautiful song called Heirloom. Enjoy. Just heirlooms to me. 
thank you, Amy. More than just heirlooms. Our Jesus, our memories, our families are alive like the lights of our Advent wreath. And so today you see that the first two candles, the candles of hope and peace, are already lit. And we come to celebrate the third week of Advent. Hear these words as we prepare to light that candle. We want everything to look nice. The decorations of the season. Our homes with their lights and tinsel, wreath and ribbons. We want to lighten the darkness around us, bring beauty to the ugliness that wears us down. We decorate because it's tradition, because it lifts our hearts, because it makes us feel like children again. We deck our halls because company is coming. The prophet Isaiah smiled when he said, God will give a garland instead of ashes. The oil of gladness instead of mourning. A mantle of praise instead of a faint spirit. Like the shepherds out in the fields, cut off from the celebrations of town, no matter how far we feel from the spirit of the season, God promises to decorate us with love and joy. We light these candles as a sign of our joy in the beautiful things of this season. Not just things that glitter, and flash, but the deeper things, the beauty of the heart and the soul, the beauty of love shared in service and hospitality. We light this candle of joy because a messenger of good news has told us that company is coming. As we celebrate the joy of the season. May we do so with grateful hearts. And may we do so in song. Mark, would you bless us? Oh, oh. 
children of Mount Pisgah this morning. Pastor Paul has been sharing with you a book of Christmas angels. And her tummy wasn't feeling good this morning, so she is at home. So I get the joy of sharing with you the next angel story. And it's one of my favorite in all of Scripture. It comes to a simple group of people who are out with their sheep, the shepherds. I don't know about you, if you've ever had a chance to go out on a farm or to a petting zoo and feel the big fluffy wool of the sheep, it's awesome. It's not as soft and perfectly wonderful as maybe that sweatshirt that you have. It usually has some sticks and leaves stuck in it, matted somewhere. But as you grab onto that wool, uh, there's something fun about the sheep and there's something fun about the shepherd. So, Hear this story of another Christmas angel. It says, out on a hillside near Bethlehem, shepherds were taking care of their sheep, and suddenly the sky became so bright with light that it hurt their eyes, and they were very frightened. Don't be afraid, someone inside the light said. It was an angel with a new message. I have good news for you. A tiny baby, like Mr. Mark saying that, was born in Bethlehem tonight, and you will find him sleeping in the hay. Have you ever played in the hay before? You can fall asleep. It can be soft, but it can be itchy, too. That's where baby Jesus was. You know, they saw a great light, and tonight, at about midnight, you can ask your mom and dad to wake you up after you've slept. There's going to be an amazing meteor shower in the sky. And if it's clear enough, if the storms of the morning have blown through, you might want to go out and see the heavens filled with lights. It says here in this story, Then the whole sky filled up with so many angels, no one could count them, and they sang, Glory to God. And then, just like that, the angels disappeared. When the angels were gone, the shepherds hurried to Bethlehem as fast as they could run. And they found the baby in a barn sleeping in the hay. Now, can you imagine going to a petting zoo and you go to one stall and they have sheep and you go to the next and they have goats and then there's a donkey or a horse you could feed and then the next one, there's a baby. Can you imagine that? A baby lying in the trough, asleep, crying. What would you do? It says the shepherds gave thanks to God because they knew who this baby was. And then they tiptoed out of the barn because the baby was asleep. And as soon as they were outside, they began telling everyone about baby Jesus. And people were amazed. What I love about this story of the baby and the shepherds and the angels that came is it says it came, they came to sit, share good news even to the shepherds. Now, I don't know about you, but every time I go to the zoo and go to the petting park where the little kids can go and play, they have hand sanitizer all around so that you can stay clean. But there's also something that you can't get rid of when you walk out of that part of the, the zoo or when you walk out of a barn and it stays inside your nose. What's that? The smell of the critters. The shepherds were stinky folks that lived out sleeping with their sheep. But they were important too. God wanted even them to get the message that he had. That good news had arrived in the form of baby Jesus. It said the angels sang and the shepherds danced and jumped. And today we want to celebrate that with another song. Miss Amy, will you come and Bless us again. And bless you. Boy. 
There was a star to light the path to where he lay. Rich or poor, they came from far and near. Cause they'd all heard the reason he was here. singing is a gift to us, so thank you. Well, this morning we come to unwrap another one of the gifts of Advent. We began the season unwrapping the gift of hope, wherein the prophet Isaiah said that God will make a way, a new way, down a new road for us in difficult times. And if that's not a message we need in 2020, I don't know what is. And last week, Paula talked to you about the gift of peace, unwrapping peace in the messiness of our lives. That the mess doesn't always leave, but the peace can still take root in our hearts. And today, there's a different color in the Advent wreath. It's a rose pink that reminds us that there's reason to celebrate in a new way. That we in this season can unwrap joy. We can unwrap joy even as the chaos continues to erupt around us. We can find joy. How do we know that? Well, we hear a story in Luke chapter 2, the same one that I read to the children. It's recorded this way in the gospel, the good news recorded by Dr. Luke. It says, there were shepherds camping in the neighborhood. They had set night watches over their sheep, and suddenly God's angel stood among them and said, excuse me, stood among them, and glory blazed around them, and they were terrified. Now, someone knocked at my door last night at midnight. Thankfully, we have a gravel driveway, because prior to the knock, I heard the tires crunching on the rocks, and I knew that someone was coming. But have you ever been awakened in the night and been terrified? Have you ever had that moment where you're startled 
and you jump and you're not sure what to do. They were keeping watch over their flock at night, listening for the sounds around them that might come to harm their sheep. And suddenly, bells and whistles went off everywhere. And they were terrified. Because people didn't come out to where the shepherds were. The angel said, don't be afraid. Have we heard that phrase before? Yes, the angel that appeared to Mary, the angel that appeared to Joseph, the angel now that appears to the shepherds says to them and to us, don't be afraid. Fear not. Why would they be afraid that God was doing something? Why would you and I be afraid if God stepped into our lives? Well, it might mean something's going to change. Hmm. So don't be afraid. I'm here to announce a great and joyful event. Good news. Great joy. That is meant for everybody. Worldwide. And that phrase in Luke's gospel is really, I believe, what the story is all about. A Savior has been born in David's town. A Savior who is Messiah and Master. And this is what you're to look for. A baby wrapped in a blanket and lying in a manger, a feeding trough. And at once the angel was joined by a huge angelic choir, Janice, singing God's praises. You know, I never thought about that. The angel gives the message, and then the backup choir comes and sings and supports it, right? There's something about when the choir starts to sing behind the messenger that gives it greater voice. And I hate that that we don't have our choir singing with us in these crazy days. It says, the choir came and sang, Glory to God in the heavenly heights, peace to all men and women on earth who please Him. And as the angel choir withdrew into heaven, they recessed out, the shepherds talked it over. Let's go. Let's go to Bethlehem as fast as we can and see for ourselves what God has revealed to us. And they left... I love this. They left running. They left running. Reminds me of my middle son. Wherever he goes, he runs. Wherever he goes, he runs. Because there's a joy about whatever's next. If he's here playing at the church somewhere and I say, Gerard, it's time we're going to come home. He's, okay, Dad. And he runs. If we're at home and we're working on one thing, he'll we stop that and I, I'll ask him, hey, can you go and help over? Okay, Dad. And he gets up on his toes and he runs. There's a joy. There's an excitement. It says they left running and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in the manger. Seeing was believing, says the message translation. Seeing was believing. And they told everyone they met what the angels had said about this child. And all who heard the shepherds were impressed says the shepherds returned and let loose, glorifying and praising God for everything they had seen and heard. It turned out exactly the way they'd been told. May God open our hearts and minds and spirits to the message for us in this letter of good news from Luke today. So here's my question to you. Why are the shepherds in the story? Why are they there? You kind of have to have Joseph and Mary's story told because this baby shows up. And you can't really have a baby without a mama. And if the baby and the mama show up, everybody's going to ask what? Who's the daddy, right? You kind of have to have their story. And a few years later, the Magi, the VIPs, show up from another nation and they kind of validate what's happened. It's like when the foreign leaders of other countries call and congratulate folks after an election. There's a, there's a sense of this is a global happening. It's big. But you see, we don't really need the shepherds, do we? Why are they in the story? We don't hear about them again. And yet, for some reason, in the middle of telling the story of God coming to earth, they get an entire chunk of the good news story about them. 
why are the shepherds in there? Bring you ever wonder? It what? brings it down to earth. It brings it down to earth. Yeah. That was John L. for those of you at home. It brings it down to earth. Why are the shepherds in there? Because the shepherds are us. You and I are the shepherds. Let me tell you a little bit about shepherds in the first century. Very much like shepherds the world over today, they lived a life out on the outskirts of everyone else. Because they had to take their flock to different pastures to graze wherever there was something to eat. The clover fields. And after the sheep had eaten there, they would take them down for water. And they would come back oftentimes to similar places and sleep, maybe two of them together with their flocks nearby so that they would have some protection with the fires to warm them, their staffs in hand I brought today, my staff that was given to me by Barbara Kane. Somebody saw it on one of our Zooms with the kids. They said it looked like a baguette from the distance on the you know, big loaf of bread. This is a staff. And the shepherds had their staffs to fight off the bad guys, right? The animals, the, the wolves and coyotes that would come to get the sheep and to gently poke and prod the sheep in the direction where they would go. But the shepherds also would lean on their staff and use their staff as a reminder that they had a place to lean and a way to lead by moving this simple object around. Shepherds were just that, simple people. They didn't have much. There was no permanent home. They moved from place to place. And when they came into town, they weren't always welcome. Many believe that these shepherds that we hear about were the shepherds that tended to the flock of sheep that were used in the sacrifices in the temple. They prepared and reared the sheep that would be given as gifts to God. Whatever the case, the shepherds were the forgotten of the society. Folks needed them. They needed the wool of the sheep. They needed the meat at times. They needed the sacrifices. But the shepherds weren't folks that you invited over for Christmas dinner. First of all, they stunk. They stunk. And they lived out on the outskirts and they sat around the fires telling stories. And their stories, well, they were like stories that happen around fires. They grew over time. The small dog that came after the sheep turned into a giant wolf or a lion or a bear. The slingshot which they used to throw at that, that raging wild animal. The pebble that distracted it became a massive boulder that they hurled over their heads. You see, the shepherds told fish stories. Now, you all may not know any shepherds, but around here I know a lot of fishermen. And if you ask them about their fishing expeditions, they'll tell you story after story after story of what they caught. But most of the times you won't get a chance to see it, will you? I learned something from a friend of mine who is a fisherman. His daddy's an outdoor sports writer. He said, Scott, don't you know how to take a picture of a fish? And I said, what do you mean? I said, in this day and age, we get proof of everything. My boy's caught a fish. I have him hold the fish. He said, no, you need to teach him how to hold the fish. I said, what are you talking about? He said, if you go like this with the fish, and the fish is closer to the camera, how does the fish look? Bigger. Bigger. <clears throat> Next time you look at a fishy thing, don't, you don't see people standing like this with the fish. Ever. They're doing this. Because that little thing now looks that big. The shepherds of their day were the fishermen of ours. They told stories 
that grew over time. The pebble became a boulder, the little dog became a wolf or a lion or a bear. In fact, the shepherds were not allowed to serve as witnesses in courts of law. Let me share that again. Shepherds were not allowed to serve as witnesses in the courts because it was universally understood that their stories could not be trusted. Maybe because they were blinded by the lights of the fire. Maybe because they had been out so long from the rest of society that folks didn't trust their words. Maybe because when they came in, they told these stories. But their witness was not accepted. So why are they in the story? They don't belong in the Christmas story. Really, at least if I were to write it. They don't belong because, well, they're not worthy of being witnesses. They have no status or standing. They live on the outskirts. They stink. We don't need them in the Christmas story, we might say. Hmm. But God knew. God knew we needed the shepherds more than anybody else. For their story is ours, and their story connects our story to God's story. They were outside and outcast. Have you ever been there? Outside and outcast. But God gives them center stage. Now, here's what's so powerful. Oftentimes we forget that there are other shepherds who were outside and outcast that took center stage in God's story. The first is a guy that had a staff and when he threw it down it became a serpent and he picked it back up again. You remember him in the Old Testament? He used his staff to part the Red Sea. Moses had a staff because he was a what? He was a shepherd. But we forget that Moses was a shepherd because first he was the adopted son of the Pharaoh and then he becomes the leader of the people of Israel. And see, we do that sometimes. We forget from whence we've come. And so we don't talk about Moses the shepherd. We talk about Moses the great leader. Well, isn't that what shepherds are? The leaders of the sheep. There's another shepherd who was center stage. He was the runt of the litter of his family. So much so that he was put out to be the shepherd while everybody else had the more important jobs. In fact, his big brothers got to go off to battle while he stayed to care for the sheep. You remember who he was? David who became the king of Israel. Moses, the prince of Egypt, as we hear. David, the king of Israel. But they started, and really in their heart, they were shepherds. So why does God do that? Why does he reach out and take the people that really the world would never put on center stage? And those are the folks that become the center of his story. I think we have the shepherd's story to remind us that it is our story. And that God's story intersects ours and that Christmas is for you and me. Not the presents under the tree, not all the adornments that we love, but the reality that God came near, not just to the important people, but that God came near to the shepherds. And if he came near to the shepherds, and he wanted them near to him, then he wants to be near to you and me. There was another shepherd, the great shepherd. His name was Jesus. See, it's interesting. The baby in the manger grew up to be, yes, the son of a carpenter. 
But in the Gospels, Jesus says, I am shepherd. I'm the gatekeeper. I'm the one who tends to you, my people, my sheep. The shepherds are you and me. The shepherds remind us that while we may be on the outside and the outskirts, in the grand scheme of worldly power, we're right at the center of God's story. And he wants to use us. I think it's fascinating that those who weren't allowed to witness in the courts are the ones whom God chooses to give witness to his arrival. Isn't that fascinating? I had the joy last weekend of being part of a grand event. I had to wear my Class A uniform with all of its bells and whistles on. And the joy of my military unit was to promote our commander and our deputy commander from one star general and colonel to two star and one star. And in the socially distanced COVID world, we had about 20 people in a massive auditorium. And the rest were like you all online. And I felt special to get to wear my fancy uniform and be on the inside. Because I got to offer a prayer. But I was reminded in that ceremony as these two great leaders spoke. And as they shared their stories. And as my boss wept as he shared his story. They both said, we stand here today because others who are out there have shown us the way. Others have walked alongside us. Others who were out on the outskirts and couldn't be in the room today. They're the reason that we're here. Today I say to you that there's a great arrival about to happen. God came near. And he's coming again. We celebrate it every Christmas, but we trust that one day he's going to come back again. And his coming is for you and me. And we know that because his coming was for the shepherds. So what did the shepherds do? And what are we called to do? First, we're, we're called to believe. We're called to believe that indeed God has come near. I don't know about you, but if I saw a great light and I heard some voices, I might think that I had had something a little too strong in my canteen and I might lay down on one of my sheep by the fire and wait till morning to see what happened. But that's not what the shepherds did. They turned to one another and they said, did you hear that? Yeah, did you see that? I did. Let's, let's go. And they ran to see what they had been told. And it says here, they ran to see for themselves. This Christmas, don't let the story be everybody else's. Run and see for yourself where God is coming near to you. Where is God coming near to you? I think if we run and believe, God will let us see. And when we see, we're called to go and witness, to tell what we've seen, even if we don't think others will believe us. You've got to remember, the shepherds knew that no one would believe their story because they were taught not to. And yet, what did they do? They ran and they told. And what did they find? That people were amazed. Now, here's where I think we miss sometimes the end of the story. We assume then that the shepherds went on to seminary and became pastors of churches, and they're the ones that passed on the gospel to everyone else. Right? But what did the shepherds go back to doing? Being shepherds. They got to see Jesus. 
They had got to hear from the heavenly hosts. The choir sang to them, serenaded them out in the fields. The angels showed up. God says, your story is important. You are who I've come to see. And I want you to come and see me. And I want you to go tell. But here's what we forget. He didn't make the shepherds pastors. Well, actually they were. The word pastor means shepherd, if you think about that. He didn't change their occupation. He didn't take them out and send them off somewhere else. He said, you be who you are. And tell my story and your story. And as you do, the world will hear that the joy and the good news is for them as well. See, the problem is if they hadn't stayed shepherds, if they'd been like Moses and become high-level leaders, they'd become like David and become kings, when you and I heard the story, we wouldn't think it was for us. Because I don't know about you, but I'm not a king. And I'm not the high-level Moses leader that leads a nation from one place to another. But the shepherds, Hmm. I can find my story in theirs. And I hope you can find yours as well. Let's pray. God, thank you for this crazy, crazy act of inclusion that you chose, not only here with these shepherds, but in calling out Moses and calling out David and using people like Ruth and Rahab. God, you continue to reach to the outskirts and the outside and pull people in. May the shepherd's story be ours. Give us eyes to see and ears to hear your good news in this time. And give us the joy to tell the story that others on the outside would know that your story is not only for us inside the walls of the church or on the church Facebook and web page, but that your joy and your good news is for all people everywhere. May it be so. We pray in the name of the one who is the good news, Jesus, our Lord. Amen and amen. Before you go today, I want to invite you to a special service this afternoon. I'm going to have it here in the sanctuary. It'll be on Facebook Live as well. It's a service of healing and hope. It's our Blue Christmas service. We've done it for, I think, about five years now. It's a service targeted for those who have lost somebody since last Christmas. But maybe you say, well, Scott, I lost somebody several years back. I'm still struggling at the holidays. Every time Christmas comes, I miss that person I love more and more. This service is for you. There's no magic words to take the pain away. There's no special song that makes it all better. But it's a time when we come and acknowledge our grief. It's a time when we come and we hold our tears together. It's a time when we come and are given the permission in the season of joy to just say it's hard to find. With the hope that as we give ourselves that permission and we walk out of the blue Christmas service, that we can also give ourselves the permission to celebrate even when it's hard. Joy comes even when the circumstances around us are hard. Remember, the shepherds to whom were given the message of joy, they went back to living on the outside. In this season, when it's sometimes hard to celebrate, I invite you to join us at 4 p.m., 
for our blue Christmas service. You're welcome to come in person with a mask or to join us on Facebook Live. We also hope to be announcing here in the next couple of days a special Facebook Live celebration of carols where some of the voices of Mount Pisgah that you know will sing uh, right here with nobody in the pews, but hopefully a lot of people watching, uh, songs of the season that we can celebrate. So we hope you'll join us. Be looking for that announcement. If you're here with us, would you stand now and receive this benediction? Scripture tells us, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, Rejoice. Go now, whatever the circumstance in your life, knowing that the Christmas story is for you, that God has come near not just to the Magi and to Mary, but to the shepherds and we the sheep. May that give you joy now and forevermore. Amen. Go in the joy of the Lord. Blessings.